theater nerds, and, and we didn't think through way back that the first game of the World Series would be taking place on the night that we're doing a debate about college sports. So, so, um, but, uh, so I, I don't know if, uh, if you're all theater nerds as well, or more in the sports world, but we're delighted that you came out, especially with the weather that we're facing tonight. Um, and I'm telling you all of this because we could use your special help. This, um, this debate lives on as a podcast, ultimately, and um, so a lot of people will hear this debate, um, and it can, you can get it through the Apple Store, uh, our app through the Apple Store, or through on Roku or on Android devices. Um, like all of our debates, we've done more than 100 so far. But the reason I'm saying all of that is that it's important that the people who listen to this debate ultimately know that you're here. So I'm going to ask you a lot to applaud with vociferous strength to let them know that there were people, that, there were, that you were all here tonight. Um, so a, th a few times throughout the course of the evening, I'm going to ask for your applause. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, two things, is that um, in the middle of the debate, I will come to you for questions, and my preference for questions, and I'll, I'll have to turn down questions that don't hit the target, is to ask questions that really get the debaters to debate more on the topic and on the question that we're arguing, which is pay college athletes or not. And so uh, if, if the question is repetitive to something that's already happened or off topic, I'm going to politely decline the question. So that's just guidance for you to really like try to not argue with them, not debate with them, but really put a good question to them. And the other thing is that we ask you to vote on this motion. And the way that we'll do that when the time comes, it's not quite yet, but is to use your phone. And the instructions uh, will come up on the screen here, but you can log in to the Wi-Fi that's in here and then go to the address iq2us.org forward slash vote and you will be able, you'll get a, uh, uh, the chance to vote yes, no, or undecided on the motion. So we want to know where you stand on that and we'll ask you at the very beginning of the debate and we'll ask you again at the end of the debate. The instructions for that are also on the back of your program. So um, that's it. Actually, a few more people are coming in. Maybe we will fill to the gills after all. Um, so I'll give it another, uh, about another minute or so. But I'm, again, I'm really glad that you're here. And just to remind you, we do want to hear your questions. So stand by, and you can, uh, you can get that up in your browser now. I will be right back. Uh, and I'd like to begin by welcoming our debaters to the stage, and if you could give them each a nice round of applause as they come in, please. First, let's welcome uh, Joe Nocera. Hi, Joe. And following Joe Nocera, Andy Schwartz. Wow. Thank you. Next, Christine Brennan. Thank you. And Len Elmore. Thank you. All right, I've got to tell you, you're doing very, very well with the applause. Nobody would ever know. So thank you for that. That's fantastic. So um, again, as I've mentioned, um, we live on as a podcast and also as a radio broadcast that's heard on public radio stations across the country. We're live streaming uh, right now, in fact. And as I mentioned before, your role as members of the audience is critical, both in asking questions in the middle of the debate and also uh, in voting, uh, because ultimately you pick our winner. And throughout the evening, I'm going to be asking you to help us make this production. You'll see uh, there will be moments when I'll say things like, um, I'll be right back, but I won't go anywhere. I'll still be here. Um, it's just for the sake of the production so that we can do some editing around it. So to launch things, I would appreciate one more time to give us our official launch. One more round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> so
so, so very often to be called an amateur is really kind of an insult, except in the one place where the term is held to be sacred, and that is in college sports. The idea that while they are still students, the men and women who participate in athletics should only be playing for the love of the game. Classroom comes first, the playing field second, and money stays out of it. Except that we all know that there is money all over college sports. Coaches are paid in the millions. There are billions in TV contracts. But who does not get paid a salary in all of this? The players themselves. And why not? Well goes the argument, they're on scholarship. And to pay them, to give them salaries, would ruin the game. But the other side says, well, they're workers anyway. They're workers who are earning billions for their universities. It's only fair that they should get paid. It's a thorny argument that's gone on for a long time, but it's flaring up again now, especially in the wake of corruption scandals. And in this, we think, are the makings of a debate. So let's have it. Yes or no to this statement, pay college athletes. A debate from Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm John Donvan. I stand between two teams of two experts on the topic who will argue for and against the motion, pay college athletes. As always, our debate goes in three rounds, and then our audience here at the Kaufman Music Center in New York City will choose the winner. And as always, if all goes well, civil discourse will also win. Let's go to the first round of voting. The motion is pay college athletes. If you go to your phones, go to a web browser, Type in iq2us.org forward slash vote. You will get prompts that enable you to, to, to vote yes, no, or undecided, which is a perfectly reasonable opening position to take. On the back page of your program, you also have explanation for how to vote. And it doesn't, you don't have to complete it in this very minute because I'm going to give everybody a few more seconds to get a look at their phone and work it, but we can move forward and you'll have a few minutes to complete the voting process. So our motion is this, pay college athletes. We have one team arguing for the motion. Let's meet them. Please first welcome Joe Nocera. Hi, Joe, and welcome back to Intelligence Squared U.S., your second time debating with us. You are a columnist at Bloomberg View. You're co-author of the book Indentured, the inside story of the rebellion against the NCAA. You have described yourself as a very big, big college basketball fan, but why college as opposed to pro for you? Well, it's pretty simple. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. We don't have professional sports, but we do have our beloved Providence College Friars, who I've rooted for all my life. All right, it makes sense. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonah Serra. And sitting by your side, Joe, is your partner in this debate, Andy Schwartz, ladies and gentlemen. Andy, you're a partner at OSKR. That's an economic consulting firm that you co-founded. You are an antitrust economist. Uh, you have described yourself in the past as a serious board gamer. What college sport would make a great board game? Well, so the problem is, is that I'm like one of those guys you ask, what kind of music do you like? And they're like, oh, every band I know is really obscure. You wouldn't know them. <laughs> so all my board games are like that. But I guess if I had to pick a, a sport that fits in the board game milieu, it would probably be baseball. It has a long history going back to Stratomatic and so I'd go with baseball. Good old baseball. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, again, the team arguing for the motion. Now, the motion, again, pay college athletes. We have two debaters arguing against it. Please first welcome Christine Brennan. Thank you. Christine, uh, you are a best-selling best author of a lot of books. You are an award-winning sports columnist for USA Today. You were the first president of the Association for Women in Sports Media. You were honored by the Women's Sports Foundation in its commemoration of the 40th anniversary of Title IX. That's a term uh, is going to come up a lot during this debate. So tell us in one or at most two sentences <laughs> what Title IX is. Well, John, it was uh, signed by Richard Nixon in June of 1972, a law mandating if you get federal funding, you must treat men and women equally. It was designed for law schools and med schools. Obviously, the sports component has been huge. I think it's the most important law in our country the last 45 years. Not that I think it's a big deal or anything. Uh, Title IX has changed the playing fields of America. And we'll hear, be hearing a lot more about it, but thank you for that explanation. Christine Brennan. And Christine, uh, your partner is the one athlete, the one, as far as I know, the one professional athlete on our panel. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, please welcome Len Elmore. 
So, uh, Len, you spent 10 years in the NBA. Before that, you were All-American at the University of Maryland. You are now an attorney. You are also a basketball analyst. You served as an assistant district attorney after you graduated from Harvard Law. You are also, for people who are only listening, six foot nine. Um, question, when you were in the courtroom, did you ever use your stature to intimidate <laughs> your opposing counsel? Uh, not intentionally. However, when we were called to the bench, I was the only one that could look eye to eye with the judge. So <laughs> I think that had some impact. <laughs> that helped. Ladies and gentlemen, Len Elmore and the team arguing against the motion. So you have all voted now uh, uh, prior to the arguments beginning. And I want to explain, after you've heard the arguments, we're going to ask you to vote a second time. And the way we determine the winner of the debate is the team whose numbers have moved up the most in percentage points. So it's the difference between the first vote and the second vote that determines our winners. Let's move on to round one. Round one are opening statements by each debater in turn. The motion is pay college athletes. The debaters in turn will be invited to stand uh, in what we're calling our intelligence square. It's a space over uh, by, the side of, uh, by their side, and they will make their presentation from there. Speaking first for the motion, pay college athletes, here is Andy Schwartz, economist and partner at OSKR. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Schwartz. Thank you, John. Um, tonight, you're going to hear uh, Christine and Glenn argue that Mandatory enforcement of amateurism is a bulwark against the forces of over-commercialization that threaten to destroy college sports. They'll ask you to ignore the fact that college sports are already hyper-commercialized with billion-dollar TV contracts and events like the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. But to economists like me, and almost any economist not on the NCAA's payroll, the NCAA's enforcement of amateurism is not noble. It is the classic conduct of an anti-competitive cartel. A cartel is a set of independent firms here, the member colleges and universities of the NCAA, that fix prices in a market where they would otherwise compete. Cartels are illegal in the United States. People go to jail for price fixing, and firms have been punished for attempting to fix the price they pay their workers. In the 1990s, one cartel that was trying to fix wages was punished by a federal court which said, and this is a quote, the cartel ultimately robbed suppliers of the normal fruits of their enterprises. That cartel was the NCAA, which had tried to fix the, the wages that were paid to coaches by the schools. And they said, well, we need to because we have to preserve amateurism. We need to save costs. And the court said, those may be fine goals, but they don't override the coach's right to seek employment in competition among the schools that would employ him or her. And so my proposition to you is rather than voting yes to the simple pay college athletes, I want you tonight to vote yes to the idea that college athletes, like their coaches, have the right to a market free of collusion, like all of us do under the law. Um, tonight you may hear the argument that if college athletes are paid, that suddenly and magically they'll stop being students. That's nonsense. Students in college get paid all the time. They work in the library, they work in the bookstore, they get paid if they're in student government, they get paid for the, on the school newspaper. One of my roommates in college got paid a commission every time he placed an ad in the school yearbook. Um, Emma Watson was at Brown University when she made many of her, her, her Harry Potter movies as Hermione Granger, and she was paid an exorbitant salary because she was able to access a free market. We may not have approved of how much money she got. We may have been worried that she would have spent the money frivolously or maybe even dangerously, but we didn't deny her her adult right to go into the market and seek compensation free of collusion. That same adult right has been, has been denied to college athletes. So where Emma Watson was treated like an adult, Deshaun Watson, who won the national championship at Clemson, was not. Instead, he was told he could have a fixed price and that was it. I'm not here to argue that every college must pay every athlete. Instead, my proposition is simple, that College athletes have the same right of market access as their coaches and as the rest of us here, and that we have let them that right be usurped by the NCAA through collusion. Should we pay college athletes is a really arrogant question. Who are we to tell a group of people whether they can or can't earn a living under the same rights that the rest of us have? A better question is, 
if there were no collusion, would college athletes get paid? And if the answer to that is yes, then you know they're being exploited because their pay is being held down by a cartel. So would they get paid? Of course the answer is yes. One, answer, one reason we know this is because college athletes are already paid. In exchange for their athletic services, they, provide, they are provided with room, board, tuition. Um, and since 2015, they get about $400 a month in cash as well. Um, this is not a free education. It's a quid pro quo. It's services for services, athletics for education. The Joe's going to talk about whether that education is, a, is being provided fairly or not. But my point here is that in a market, if schools were not bound by NCAA collusion, they would offer athletes every single bit of education they offer them today and education. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And um, anything else you hear about this tonight ends up being a quibble when you think about it being a fundamental right. So one quibble you might hear is that Alabama and Ohio State will get all the best football players and Kentucky and Duke will get all the best basketball players, but that happens now. There's actually very good economics that shows that fixing prices hurts competitive balance, it doesn't help it. Um, you may hear doctored NCAA statistics that nobody makes any money, but there's plenty of money when the coach needs a $5 million pay, the assistant coach needs a million dollars, um, and um, the good news is, is that unlike coaches' pay, as athlete pay rises for men, Title IX ensures that an equivalent amount will be d dedicated to women. So what we'll see is a sort of Title IX 2.0. Um, if you hear the myth that um, compensation and education just aren't compatible, please listen carefully. Is it about something about who's getting the money? Why is it okay for Emma Watson? to get the money and Katie Ledecky to be paid to swim while she's at Stanford, but it's not okay for Deshaun Watson or for Richard Sherman to get paid to play football while he's at Stanford. Um, finally, don't fall, fall for the fact that no one will watch. If no one will watch, then no one will pay because pay in a market is driven by businesses' desire to attract customers. And so um, if in your mind you suspect that if allowed to, colleges would pay, then what you're saying is that you know that fans would still attend. And that's why I want you to, to answer yes to the proposition, because athletes deserve the right to find out the answer what they're worth. Thank you, Andy Schwartz. <laughs> the motion again is pay college athletes, and here to make his opening statement against the motion, Len Elmore, attorney, former NBA player. Ladies and gentlemen, Len Elmore. Pay-for-play is a cop-out. It teaches nothing. It infects the true mission of sports and higher education. And you got to consider this. There is no right to play college sports. There's no statutory, natural, or God-given right. No one forces the athletes to play. There are options that exist for basketball and even football players to play somewhere other than college. It's a benefactor-beneficiary relationship where the athletes as beneficiaries accept the conditions set forth by the benefactors in exchange for the benefits that include free education, free world-class training. Now, if you quantify those benefits, room, board, books, tuition, cost of attendance stipends, which can sometimes go to as high as $6,000, then add medical benefits, world-class coaching, training, in world-class facilities, the ability to build a brand on national TV. How much would those benefits be worth on an open market? Now, no one can argue that the NCAA has done it perfectly, but no one can reasonably argue that these benefits don't have significant value. The mission of higher education is leadership development. Competition against similarly situated folks on a playing surface in front of crowds is a dynamic element of leadership development. That kind of pressure yields diamonds, even among athletes who never make it to the pros. Few college students have that opportunity. Play for Play blows up that mission with its distractions. Only tuition is tax-free. You know, any benefit not directly attached to the education mission is taxable, but the IRS just looks the other way for now. Imagine every athlete having to file a tax return. That just adds to the burdens that college athletes already have. Play for play destroys the pro-social 
benefits of college sports. 96% of the revenue derived from tickets and media sales go back to the institutions who in turn utilize it for programs that work to the benefit of student athletes. The revenue serves the greater good. That includes supporting Division II, supporting Division III, subsidizing non-revenue sports with money for scholarships and other beneficial programs. Now, play for play obliterates the line between sports and pro sports and college sports. College sports galvanize small city and big city communities, college communities. The academic and sports success of beneficiaries lead benefactors to contribute more. And the success of the beneficiaries through graduation, earning a degree, and post-sports and college success leads them to become benefactors through foundations, through other ways that they contribute to the community causes. And yes, it is a social and racial justice issue. However, not for the reasons our opponents have stated. You know, black athletes carry the burden of academic failure in revenue-generating sports. Fifteen years ago, the graduation rate for African-American basketball players was 46 percent. Today, according to the graduation success rate, it is now 77 percent. Now, those numbers could improve, but guess what? They were done without paying a single dime of pay for play. Now, nevertheless, the growth over those 15 years is something that people marvel at, but the bottom line is, it's just the shiny object that draws these athletes out momentarily, but it gives them nothing as far as future survival. You've heard from the opposition fair value of college athletes, or you will. How about focusing on valuing education fairly? For people of color, particularly black athletes, education is resistance. What better than a degree to help you prepare and resist the ravages of racism in a world that essentially is hostile to you because of the color of your skin. It's time we viewed pay for play as a sarcastic deterrent and payoff to deter that type of resistance. Now, if you were distracted by all this fake money, <laughs> imagine what it's going to do to an 18-year-old who thinks that he or she is going to college to get paid as opposed to getting a higher education. The corruption in college sports, that we probably will touch on, has its roots fueled by money. But rather than destroy those roots, pay for play deepens them. Every ill that has been mentioned and will be mentioned by the proponents of pay for play can be cured by controlling spending, continued academic reform, and assuring that direct commercial success inures to the benefit of the college athlete first and foremost, their health, safety, and welfare not by substituting a fix in amounts that probably will have less impact than an earned degree on the lives of these athletes. And for that reason, I urge you guys to vote no on this proposition. Thank you, Len Elmar. And a reminder of where we are, we are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, debating this motion, pay college athletes. You've heard the first two opening statements and now on to the third, making his way to the Intelligence Square. Here is Jonah Serra. He is Bloomberg View columnist and co-author of Indentured, the inside story of the rebellion against the NCAA. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonah Serra. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a lot to stay here, but I'm going to start by just summing up what Len said. Let's exploit black college football and men's basketball players for the greater good of everybody else. That's the bottom line. Now, I have six points I want to get through, so I need to get moving. Um, but I'm going to start where Len started, education. So a free education is supposed to, what you, is supposed to be what you get, and it's what the NCAA promises. In fact, it says on the website, in the collegiate model of sports, the young men and women competing on the field or court are students first, athletes second. And Len says that the college education is so valuable that an athlete should be thrilled to have this as his only form of compensation and should ignore how much more the market might provide. You know, here's the deal. Education should be their trump card, but it's the, actually the reason you should vote with us. Because 
far too many college football and men's basketball players simply don't get a real education or anything close to it. So you've read about the University of North Carolina scandal. 20 years, fake classes, right? No professor, no class, one paper which is graded by the administrator, right? And not only did the NCAA say that this was okay, that it didn't violate any rules, they called it a benefit a benefit to the, to the athlete. Think about that. Fake classes are a benefit to athletes who are there to get an education. Explain how that works. Explain how that's right. Now, race. Race is an important, important subtext of this whole conversation. The University of Auburn, 3.2% of, of the undergraduates are African American. 78% of the football and men's basketball players are African-American. There are similar stats at places like every big-time sports school, practically, Ohio State, Florida, University of Louisville. Something close to half of all Division I football athletes receive Pell Grants, which are reserved for the lowest uh, income families in America. A college education is supposed to be life-changing. But listen to some statistics, some real statistics, not the phonied up NCAA graduation statistics, which, by the way, don't count any athlete who drops out. That's the graduation statistic doesn't count athletes who drop out. Think about that one for a second. In the Big Ten, black men's basketball players have a graduation rate of uh, that is 36% lower than non-athletes. The Big 12, minus 42%. The Mountain West, minus 51%. Michigan State, 33% of black male athletes graduate in six years compared to 78% of non-athletes. And a lot of those who do graduate major in something called eligibility, i.e. they just take any class that the academic advisor sends them to so that they, so they, so they can stay on the field. This is exploitation. I don't even know how else you can call it anything else. They've been recruited to the campus for one reason, one reason to generate revenue for the university. That's why they're there. You can't say that about anybody else on campus, including, I might add, hockey players and baseball players who don't generate revenue. So now they're going to say that they're not employees because right? they're quote unquote student athletes. Right? They're not employees. But when the NLRB in Chicago held a hearing to discuss whether the Northeastern football team qualified under the law as employees, they wound up saying, yes, they did. They, they work 60 hours a week. Their boss, their coach, controls almost every aspect of their lives. They are employees. They can't take classes that get in the way of, of their sport. That's why they're there. Now, student athlete, I've got to do this quickly because I'm running out of time. Why, you're going to hear that word, phrase a lot, student athlete. You know where it comes from? 1956, the NCAA made it up because some states were thinking of giving badly injured football players workman's comp. So the idea is if you call everybody a student athlete, they'll think they're students and they're not employees and therefore they won't get student uh, workman's comp no matter how badly they're hurt. That's a really fair system, don't you think? We've talked, everybody agrees that college sports is a huge business. It's actually a $13 billion business. Just a little bit less than the, than the NFL. And, you know, we're all talking about how much money the coaches make. ESPN is paying $7.3 billion to televise the new college football playoffs. That's three games a season. Three games. So why is it okay to have a business that maximizes revenue in every aspect, but the labor force is supposed to be free? How is that right? I want to talk, finally, about scandals. So we have, every scandal revolves around money. Somebody's passing money to somebody under the table. That's what happens over and over and over and over. The latest one is the Louisville scandal, where, among other things, a marketer for Adidas uh, was paying a player $100,000 to get him to go to the University of Louisville, where, where Adidas has paid, by the way, $160 million to put the uniforms and the shoes on the athletes of all the times, of all the teams. The, the NCA finds this horrifying. It's a huge scandal, it's terrible. But think about what kind of scandal this is. This is like prohibition. Drinking was against the law during prohibition until they changed the law and then drinking was fine again. That's what's going on here. 
If you vote with us, you're voting for a system that is healthier, fairer, more honest, and more just. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenna Sarah. And again, the motion is pay college athletes. And here to make her opening statement against the motion, Christine Brennan, sports columnist for USA Today. Ladies and gentlemen, Christine Brennan. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. It's a real delight to be up here with, uh, with four friends. And I do have to give uh, Joe and Andy some credit here. I'm going to give you your props right away. You've used the word women as well as men in this conversation. Because, folks, let me tell you this. When you've heard the conversation about paying athletes, what have you heard? The words basketball and football. They haven't used the word pesky, the pesky adjective men's, have they? Men's basketball? No, no, it's been basketball and football as if there's no other sports that exist. So I have to give you guys credit for talking about women because can you imagine a place, a time in this country where you could pay men but not pay women? And in reality, that is what this conversation has been. Guys, again, all props to you for mentioning women, for acknowledging that women play sports. But when we hear this argument over and over again, ladies and gentlemen, it's about men. 2017, we're going to pay men but not women. And I know you guys said we will. You talk to any athletic director in the country, and they're thinking, wow, how in the world do we do this? How do we pay field hockey as well as football? You have to under Title IX. Or if you don't, if the idea is all about revenue producing and we're only going to pay the people that supposedly make money, uh, if you do that, well, uh, then think of the Title IX lawsuits. You will just have hundreds and hundreds of lawsuits in this country, as, uh, as there should be, if in fact you're not paying women equal to men. That is a conversation, and that's one of the things that I, I would like to focus on with my teammate Len here, is what is this going to look like? What is this going to look like? So let's, okay, let's pay him. Let's pay everybody. Um, I've got some college football fans here. Shout out one of your, your school you cheer for. Anyone cheers for Alabama? Auburn, another one? There you go. Wow, there you go. <laughs> Len, I think we got his vote. Um, so you guys are, for Maryland, you've got an offensive tackle. Now we're paying him. We're paying, what, 100000 a year? And all of a sudden, Auburn says, you know, we, we need an offensive tackle halfway through the season. And we'll pay him 150000 a year. So there goes your offensive tackle, right? If you can move around. Now, now maybe, maybe you have rules, right? And you say, well, you can't move except for a year or two. Think about that. Think about the money, as if we need more money in sports. And what will that look like? Len mentioned, of course, paying taxes. All these kids now having to pay taxes. Uh, the field hockey players moving from here to there because they don't like their job. The way you might want to move halfway through a year in a job that you're in. The chaos that that could, that could uh, leave for everyone. And, and as fans of football, there is something to say, hey, when that punter is out there on the field and you're cheering for him, uh, that he was in a chemistry class as you were. And I know our friends are saying, oh, they'll still take classes. Really? Really? Uh, yeah, that would be wonderful if they do. But the odds are if they're there for the money, it's minor league sports, and they're just going to want to obviously uh, play, play football or whatever the sport is for the money. It would be great to have them in class. But will they? I was uh, with a whole group of Big Ten people actually on an Alaska cruise, and I asked this question. I said, these are super fans. They spent money to go to Alaska. They have season tickets. I said, would it change football for you and men's basketball for you if we were paying everybody? And I asked for a show of hands, and every single person, Iowa, Purdue, Minnesota, Ohio State, Maryland, Northwestern, where I went to school, everyone said it would change it for them. They would be less likely to support it. They would be less likely to go and cheer for it. So those are just the facts, folks. You know, the other thing that we hear a lot from our friends on the other side of, the, of this issue is uh, the conversation about athletes not being compensated. And Len referred to a little bit of this, but I just want to make sure I make this point clearly. Forbes uh, money, who knows exactly what the dollar figure is. Forbes said that $2 million plus over four years for a, a football player that the value of that education and that experience at a college, two million plus. Uh, USA Today, uh, my newspaper, men's basketball, a half million dollars they figured over the four years. Again, what is that? Len mentioned it, elite coaching, tutoring, training, food, medicine, uh, all of those wonderful things, the exposure on Saturday night to show your wares so that someday a future employer can see what you're doing and hire you. What would the violinist in the symphony, in the school symphony, give 
to be on TV every Saturday night so that you could watch her do her thing, playing the violin, so that she could someday be hired by a symphony. What is the value of being on network TV over and over as football and men's basketball is? Maybe someday we will have the violinist channel, I don't know. But right now we don't. But think about the value of that and what these student athletes have now. Uh, and I, the last thing in the last minute that I have here is that we hear that money is floating all over the, around, of course, all over the place. Absolutely. Our college coaches paid exorbitant amounts. That's not the conversation for today. I think all four of us could agree. The answer is yes. These college coaches, football coaches, men's basketball are paid through the, through the roof. That's not what we're debating here today. We're debating about the funds that are there. And according to USA Today, 23 programs are self-sufficient. 23, not hundreds, and I know we may disagree on this, gentlemen, but the reality is that for all the money that they're, that they're bringing in, so many of them are spending it. And there's 23, the Ohio State's, the Michigan's, the Florida's, the Texas, you know, those, those are the schools that are making the money. The rest are not balancing out. So this idea that there's money just floating around there to pay everyone, um, we're, we're finding that's just not the case. So anyway, thanks so much for listening. Hope you vote with us, and on we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine Brennan. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is pay college athletes. Now we move on to round two, and in round two, the debaters can address one another directly, and they take questions from me and from you and our live audience here in New York City. The motion is pay college athletes. We have heard the team arguing for the motion, Andy Schwartz and Joe Nocera, arguing that the question itself is condescending to the players, that those players have the same right as any other college student to uh, earn money while they're at college. They point out that students earn money for all sorts of jobs. Why not for sports? Why not let the free market determine what their value is? They say that the current system is one that particularly exploits black players for the sake of everyone else. They cite the scandal in terms of whether there's an education going on of fake classes. Um, they point out that the majority of players uh, are uh, African, uh, rather half of the players approximately are African American and vulnerable to this sort of exploitation. And the bottom line they finish with this assessment comes from Jonah Serra, that these players were recruited for one reason only, one reason only, he says, and that was to make money for the university. The team arguing against the motion, Christine Brennan and Len Elmore, they, they use the term pay for play and they use it very distastefully. They say pay for play would ruin uh, college sports, that it would ruin the sense of community, that it would ruin the opportunities that exist for players, African American and others, to get an education because kids would start going to college not to get an education, they would start going to college in order to get paid. They say that college sports currently still succeed in galvanizing communities, encouraging benefactors to give to universities they support, and that that would be lost when, uh, when the system would move to pay for play. And by the way, they point out what happens to women's programs in a system where the free market comes into play? Uh, what happens to women's sports? Do they get an equal crack at this as well? And what happens to colleges that just can't pay? So there is a lot there. There is a lot through this lens to discuss, uh, through the lens of whether or not to pay college athletes. We can talk about ideals, the pragmatics, the educational factor. But I want to, I want to go back to the point I found Joan O'Sara made that sounds so devastating if true, if true, that um, co colleges are recruiting these players for one reason only, and that's to make money for the universities. That's a devastating statement to make. And I want to take it to you, Len Elmore, on the opposing side to respond to it. Well, in, in some ways, it is true. It, it's translated into wins and losses. And just as importantly, it also translates into opportunity. I mean, there's no question about it. You know, you can recruit guys and gals to be able to win games for you, but by the same token, those same guys and gals can utilize that opportunity to better themselves. It's a pr quid pro quo. And the bottom line, as I said, it's a beneficiary benefactor relationship. Uh, no one has the right to play college sports. I keep hearing that, but you know, it's just not true. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about anecdotes, and Joe throws out a lot of anecdotes, and, and I think it might be intellectually dishonest to say, don't listen to the NCAA stats and don't really believe this, but where's the proof that they're wrong? All we've had are anecdotes instead of patterns. And as a lawyer, I, I deal more with trends and patterns than just anecdotes to illustrate my points. So, you know, when you're thinking about all of this, 
just remember, again, you got to have some gravitas to your, to your statements. And, and I haven't heard anything that supports those anecdotes. Let me bring it to Andy Schwartz. Sure. Well, so uh, the College Sports Research Institute, which is based at the University of South Carolina, led by Richard Southall and Mark Nagel, produces a revised version of the NCAA's graduation rates. It's peer-reviewed, and they go through and they, dis they demolish what the NCAA does to doctor their stats. The same thing applies for the financial reports. You can look at works by Rod Fort, Dave Barry, uh, Dan Ratcher, who's my business partner. Um, the sports economics community has studied this for 30, 40 years. This is not anecdote. This is, this is social science. And so, what, 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 what about to Lynn Elmore's point, and it was to, in answer to my question, but it just goes back to Joan O'Sara, that, that in fact the trade-off is worth it for the students. They're not, they're not forced into this. They have the option not to go to college, but in fact, by going to college, they're making a deal education for the work that I do. And they're so, not denying that well, it's work. Well, so, so, Joan O'Sara, I want to. Well, well, and if, first of all, the idea that they can decide to not go to college is silly, especially if you're a football player. Uh, I mean, you, need, you can't even be uh, drafted until, after you're, until you're a junior. And the only way, and your bodies aren't ready, it, you have to go to college. It, it's non-optional. Um, you know, the, the second I, if, if you had a chance at a real education, yes, maybe there's something to the trade-off, although they're still not getting their market value, and I still think that's wrong. But, you know... Well, let's, let's just take that side of it. Let's put aside whether they're getting their fair market value and just talk about are they getting the education part of it that your opponents say. I'm going to bring for, that to you. For most, college for most college football, for too many college football and men's basketball players, the answer to that question is no. That's a dangerous word, most, because you don't know. Yeah. You don't know. But you you can't let, me, let, me bring, let me bring Christine into it. Do you want to respond to that point? Well, again, not well. I'll, I'll echo my, my uh, teammate. It, most of, I, my goodness, how many of us, I think probably every single one of, uh, of you in this room, I know many of us, all of us, uh, know people who played sports in college and they're successful professionals, right? I mean, um, are there problems? Absolutely. On that, we can agree. Uh, is it perfect? Of course not. Uh, but uh, my belief, my strong belief, our strong belief is that to pay athletes doesn't make it better. And I think that's where we stand on this thing, very simply. Andy Schwartz. So on the question of rights, none of us have a right to a television set either. But what we have is the right to, when we go into a market and buy a television set, not to have all the television set manufacturers get together and collude on the price. The Sherman Act was passed in 1890. That is a right embedded in law. And the idea here is that when, I, I don't have a right to play college, college sports, but I do have a right if I go to college to say, I want you to tell me how much my scholarship is going to be worth without colluding with others. The same thing happened in the Ivy League around the time that I was applying. All of the Ivy League schools colluded on how much merit aid they would give at zero. They didn't give any merit aid by agreement. The Department of Justice stepped in and said that was illegal, and all of the schools agreed to stop. Let me, let me move on to a, another point that your opponents made. I'm taking this to the against side. They talked about Emma Watson, the actor, uh, being at Brown uh, and being able to make a lot of money. They, 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 you, you argued, wouldn't it be nice if violinists got paid? And sometimes violinists can get paid. They can perform in concerts. They're saying if all of these other students can get paid for their jobs, why shouldn't, why shouldn't for their activities, for their activities, for their talents, why, shouldn't, why should college uh, football players and basketball players be different? Well, to start out with, they've already got the scholarship. So Emma Watson did not have a scholarship, correct? I don't know, actually. Well, she did not have let's a scholarship. Assume, let's assume she didn't. She okay. did not have an acting scholarship. Does anybody scholarship know Emma Watson's to... situation? They, they don't no. know. <laughs> I will say this. I had no idea Emma Watson would be mentioned more than any other athlete at this point. <laughs> or early, any athlete, period. But we love it. Let's, uh, we get, we, we're, going, we're going to talk about Emma Stone next. Um, but the, um, you know, so... Emma Watson is an actor who is going to college, and that's fantastic, right? But if you have signed up to have a scholarship and play then for Brown, well, in, in the case of Brown, it's the <laughs> Ivy League, so let's make this uh, Ohio State, and you are, well, then that's the deal. And of course, again, I, I do, we agree it is not perfect. That is not the issue for any of us here. 
There, of course, are areas where they can, they can be improved and discussed, and I think probably the youngest person in this room, when you're 80, we're still gonna be discussing some of this. Um, but in terms of the, the fact that you are going to get a free education, for all of you parents out there who've paid full freight, <laughs> Well, I'm not going to hold my breath for a parent-led march on Washington in the next 20 or 30 years, but wow. So not only do they get a scholarship if you're an athlete, but now they're going to be paid, and again, how much? Okay, I want to, how I much, want to, guys? I want to come back to the trade-off of the scholarship, but I want to go back to the question that I asked your opponents about if certain students can get paid for their activities, why not college football players? Did you feel that answer was addressed? Just now, do you feel that that your point was addressed in that? Not, not especially. I mean, uh, okay, Farrell. you can use Emma. Emma, what's let's, let's take her out of it. Might not be the best <laughs> example, but look, when I was in college, I worked in the photography lab. I also had a scholarship, not not athletic, but I had an academic scholarship. I worked in the photography lab. I paid taxes. I was an employee of the university. The world did not come to an end. It did not distract me from my studies. I was able to do it. Yeah, I, I think it, it's it just putting money into the equation is not necessarily this corrupting, horrible thing. You're paying somebody for doing some work. Yeah. That's, how, that's what happens in America all the time. Okay, let me let Len let respond to that. Well, take a, look at, take a look at the factors we're talking about when it comes to these young basketball and football players. How they were raised with regard to being an AAU teams, being um, coddled in many ways, not really understanding. People, coaches complain about that all the time, that they don't have uh, the necessary understanding of what real life is all about. And it continues in college. Um, the point being made, and, and you want to use anecdotes, I'll use one. Cardale Jones from Ohio State, the quarterback, immediately when he would read before the draft, they asked him about his stay at Ohio State. He says, man, you know, I wasn't there to, I, I was there to play football. I wasn't there to play school. And then after he goes to the Buffalo Bills, real life smacked him in the face. All of a sudden now, education is very important. I think it's the most important thing of all. So if we're going to use anecdotes, he's not the only one, I guarantee you, to be able to say that. And, and that's the bottom line. It comes down to distraction. You know, I, I only got paid $15 a month. That was what the NCAA allowed. And, you know, so we didn't have those distractions. I'm sure you didn't have that distraction because you knew you had to work. You knew you had to study. But when these kids come to school, they think, and I did too, that you're there to play ball. Well, how would Cardale be any more distracted than he was if he was getting paid? He wasn't even getting paid and he was distracted. I mean, you, uh, no, I didn't, how, say, how I didn't money, say he was distracted. How would money change I didn't it? say he was distracted. He just said he was there to play football. That's not distraction. Mm. That's apathy. That's and, a whole different story. Well, and, and that's the, what we're we fighting. Can, we can answer that. We can actually answer that in one line. You let the athletes take one or two classes a semester instead of five. That's part of the problem. And you give them a lifetime scholarship so that when life whacks, whacks them in the face, they can come back in 10 years and get their, get their degree. Solved. Problem yeah. solved. And, and do you want to say something, Chris? Yes, please. Just, how, much you pay, how much are you paying everybody? I mean, you're paying what the market right. how, values how, how so And you sign a contract. It's a million? I mean, so like... Uh, Is that it, what they want to pay? Right. And, and schools, then, schools are run by people with PhDs. Are they incompetent? I'm sorry? Can, schools are run by people with PhDs who hire, they run... No, 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 but what I'm saying is this is all predicated on everyone showing up Saturday and everyone watching on Saturday, Okay, correct? so if, if, I'm, if I'm running an athletic department and I know that my fan base is vehemently opposed to the idea of well-paid athletes, why would I pay a dollar more? Because that's going to turn people away. The reason I run the program is to sell tickets. Well, if I'm selling tickets to people who don't want to come. Because aren't there going to be programs that do want to pay and others that don't? And aren't you actually just going to kill college football? We have a great real-world example of this. That's, that's, we have an experiment that's been going on for a decade. Kentucky basketball. Would that be men's are, basketball? Are you, Kentucky men's are basketball. Are you accusing them of something? They, they bring them in. Calipari, John Calipari... Uh, 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 recruits players who know they're only going to be in school for one semester, they're complete mercenaries, they play their season, they're gone. Does anyone in Kentucky care? Do they still go to the game? Yeah. Do they still watch TV? Of course well, they do. I care. Are these athletes, I'm not are these athletes real, are these are athletes only, real those students? Those are only two or three guys per, on the team every year. Two or three guys. What happens to the other eight? Out of 13. Uh, what happens to the other eight? 
But what, the question, well, no, no. The what issue happened, on the table. What happens to the other eight? But what do you mean? What happens? Yeah. What happens to them? Do they go for four years? Do they graduate? Do they do any of those things? Are they getting paid? Yes. Uh, what are you saying? Yes. 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 Oh, you know they're getting paid. Okay. Here's the thing. Is that it, let, you let know me, they're getting I, paid? I want to do a little bit of economics here. If you have a cap but no floor and you see somebody receiving up to the cap, then you know that in a free market, their market value is at least as much as they get in the current market because they aren't constrained on the bottom, they're only constrained on the top. You release the cap, the people who aren't worth any more will still get a scholarship, the people who are worth more will get more. Where does the money come from? Right now, tons of money is funneled to coaches because they can recruit. If you ask, I'm sure that if you... The players are getting paid, is what you're saying. Players are getting paid, through, <clears throat> coaches are getting paid to bring in players. If you can pay the players directly, the coach can be paid for his coaching skills and not so much his recruiting skills. That's, this that's is Calipari. Calipari would okay. get less money. I happen, reason, to, I, happen to have, I happen to have on my card of notes, Calipari makes $7 million a year. The reason Kentucky matters here is not because of what happens to the other eight players, but because the state of Kentucky, the city of Lexington, the school at the University of Kentucky, they could care less that these players are coming in and out and have no interest in school whatsoever. They could care less. They still go to the games. They still root for the team. They were del delirious when they won the national championship a few years ago. So the idea that people are not going to come to the games anymore if the payers are played is baloney. Well, but if we, they heard, if they found out that their guys were getting paid, even under the table, do you think that would be something to make them happy? That's one question. The second question <laughs> I have is, you know who called Actually, Paul Actually, I'd like to hear the answer okay. to that question. I go, I go back to the same point, which is that unless the athletic director and the president of the university is incompetent, they won't pay so much as to turn away their fans. That's how markets work. If, if, so, like if somehow, like when you went into Starbucks, they're like, you found out that the people were getting well paid, you would go, ew, I don't want to drink this coffee, then, then Starbucks would pay their people less. Okay, you lend, your, lend your second question. No. You, you know who Carl Pagliani is, right? Say that again. Carl Pagliani is he's, he's a, a, an economist, historical economist. You know who that is, right, Andy? Great transformation. You've read that, right? Okay. And what does he say? What well, is his I, major point? There is no free market. The economy in existence, there is no free market that can exist without government or other authority regulation. The only thing you're talking about is having somebody else regulate it. To no, regulate it from about, your side. I'm talking about federal you know, law applying, not a private cartel. Well, well if of you're schools. talking about Andy, law, Andy, let me let me bring a question to you that sort of ties back to Christine's opening comment about issues of gender here. Mm -hmm. What if the free market places a higher value on male athletes yeah. versus female athletes? Should no, those women, should, a, should both be paid the same? So on the same scale? Well, so I, I think that Title IX is one of, like Christine said, I think Title IX is one of the most important laws passed in the last century and continuing into this century. And I don't know if people know this, but I'm in the process of starting a league. And we actually wrote to the Department of Education and said, if we pay male athletes, what's the implication for the female athletes at the schools that we're working with? And they wrote back saying, you have to match dollar for dollar. It's not exactly dollar for dollar, but close enough. And so this is why I say that if we let the market open up and athletic directors decide that their fans can tolerate, say, $100,000 a player. What that means is that they have to make sure they budget $100,000 times 13 for women's sports too, if we're talking about basketball. And if they can't afford that, then they have to lower the amount they pay the men, male players to make sure they comply with the law because federal law dominates here. And so that's the idea, is, that, is the idea that schools will open themselves up to litigation is, I think, kind of silly, or it means they're pretty poorly run. And so we're almost like, well, schools are run by incompetence, so we better not pay athletes. Right, oh, let, let, me let, let me let Christine respond well, to that. Well, no, that's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is, uh, as a living, breathing adult, where, again, the term basketball just gets thrown around here and, and football, I love that you guys are talking about paying women the exact same amount as men, but folks, in this argument, that is not what anyone else is talking about. Kudos to you, but the reality of this conversation is all about paying men, not women. And again, Andy, I'll put you in charge of paying the women, but if, I, I'll, can, can I I'll believe it when, you, I, you, when you I see do, it, folks. You do concede that common sense fact, that, that the world out there is talking about paying the men players. NBA players get paid more than WNBA. If there were a Title IX for professional basketball players, they would get paid but around that's the not, same. But the point is, see, you just opened the door there, Andy. That's professional. This is college. And we have made a choice as Americans that we want our girls to have the same opportunities as their brothers. 
in high school and college. It is not about paying. It is about, is it about it's not about a free so, market, it's about college. So again, go ahead, I, I, I hope, I'm gonna put you in charge then, Andy, of paying all the women equal to men. And I'll believe it, folks, when I see it. So again, keep that in mind, because so, you, you are talking about loads of money now that uh, I guess it all come from Nick Saban's so contract. Is your, position, Jonas, is your position then that gender inequality is okay once you leave college? No, it's not okay. Well, then why is it okay for the women to be paid less in professional no, basketball the, than the men? The, the answer is because the market values men's professional basketball more than it values women's professional right, basketball. Right, if you're now putting the college into the market, yeah. then what I am saying is, to the reality of this conversation, is that you're going to end up having men get paid more than women, which so, will be a Title IX violation at every university. Do, in the do, you, get, do you get a, a W-2 from USA Today? Uh -huh. yes, okay, so, so uh, they pay payroll taxes for you, right? Actually, they don't, but we okay. don't need to go Okay, but let's that imagine, they, <laughs> imagine, they, imagine they did, right? So when, when companies know they have to pay their workers withholding taxes, they calculate that into how much they pay. Title IX is like a basically 100% payroll tax. Every dollar of scholarship you give to a male, you more or less give one dollar of scholarship Although, as you know, for years, colleges haven't even done right. that, and most universities today are not compliant. Right. So again, Andy, I'm putting you in charge, because you are doing more than most colleges today if you, in fact, are, are going to go let, let, do let, with what you're do saying. Do you want to finish your point? No, I just want to say that if the reason we don't pay college athletes is because college universities are breaking the law, that strikes me as punishing the wrong people. I want to return to uh, this. I, I, want to return, well. I want to return to a little bit more of, uh, now, a little bit of the cultural part of the conversation we had. There are two things. Is, is, the, is the education for real? And the other is, what is the impact on the community that exists around college football? The love of the alumni, the love of the small town, all, all of that. Your, your opponents, uh, Jonas Sarah, are, and I know that you, you used the Kentucky example, but more broadly, uh, uh, if you can take on the... The, the, the rationale behind what they're saying, that it will just turn people off to know that the athletes on the field are employees working for a paycheck, and they're just not going to love the game, they're not right. going to love the sport anymore. And, and I can see the to, rationale to that, but what about I'm about it? to blow my closing statement, but what the heck. Um, <laughs> no, don't do that. When, when um, in the 1960s and 1970s, when baseball was, players were fighting for free agency, Kurt Flood, basically lost his career for this reason. Other players fought. Marvin Miller, the union head, fought. People said, owners said, fans said, this will destroy baseball. This will be the worst thing that ever happens to baseball if players get free agency and they can go from one team to another and they can, they, can, they can argue for their own money, for their own paycheck. It was the best thing that ever happened to baseball. Baseball is much more prosperous today. Uh, it's a much better sport than it was uh, back then. So the, she has, they have no way of knowing that people will be turned off. I really have no way of knowing it. I think they'd be fine with it in about five minutes. But the fact of the matter is you won't know until you do it. You just okay. don't know. All right, fair, fair we, enough. We don't know the future, but we're having a debate, so you got to... Uh, <laughs> yeah. no, it, no, it's, a, it's a fair enough point, but I want to hear how you would argue against it. Take it, Len. Well, well, look, it, it comes down to the fact that, one, you're talking about professionals, and people have one concept of what professionals are about. They have another concept of what college athletes and athletics is all about. Now, you know, I will also concede that the concept of amateurism, a classic concept, is an anachronism. You know, we need to change. It's not professional, but it's not purely amateur. And that's one of the problems the NCAA has had in being able to redefine that. The Olympics is not amateur because they're getting paid as well. But it's certainly not professional unless you're playing basketball. Bottom line is, you know, you have the galvanization of communities around college sports because their attitudes are about college sports. But People, why, why would that change if the athletes well, we were paid? Man. Well, well I was going to say that, that it comes down to, if people understood that these were pros again, well, this is a minor league now. Yeah. How many people are minor <laughs> leagues getting? Right, because minor leagues. The, um, the other thing, again, is balance. What we're certainly, I think, probably all agreeing on is some schools will not be able to pay as much as others in, in the idea of paying athletes. And some might not want to pay them at all. That's okay. Yeah. So, well, well we, if, we I, may, three, if we I may continue, two. Andy, if I may continue. Sorry. And so, for example, you've got 
you guys are SEC fans or Big Ten fans or whatever, and you know there's a league, and you feel like it's all pretty much on the some equal footing in some way or other, right? And there's, they're going for bowl games or they're doing whatever they're doing and men's hoops, women's hoops, same thing. Well, say goodbye to that. Say goodbye to that because no, there's no way my alma mater Northwestern is going to be able to pay what Ohio State pays. Women's hoops, let's go with the idea that you guys are going to pay women athletes, all women athletes, which is great. I'll be cheering for it uh, when it happens. It ain't happening, but I'll be, I'd love to see it happen. So, okay, so what, who could pay women's basketball? We know Tennessee probably could, UConn. So now you're a high school girl and you play basketball. Well, you probably want to get paid, right? So maybe there's two or three schools that are going to pay their female basketball players. So then the rest of them will get, those are the best ones, will go there. So say goodbye, folks, to competitive balance forever. It will change everything you've thought about college football, college okay. let, basketball. Let, let's let, let's let your fact. opponents respond to that. Would you like to take an Andy? So, or, so or one thing, are you worried that UConn will get all the best women's basketball players? <laughs> well, they didn't, win, uh, they didn't win the national title this year, that's for sure. Well, there's a difference between uh, recruiting, outcome, recruiting outcomes are driven by money, and on-court basketball is driven by training and all sorts of things. Len can tell you the best team doesn't always win every night. Sometimes weird things happen. It's a stochastic event. And so... You, if you want to look at competitive balance in terms of compensation, you look at recruiting. And there is a ton of research that shows that, that fixing maximum pay creates powerhouse teams that endure forever. So you get a situation where you can look at the top 10 teams in football in the 40s, the 60s, the 80s, the 2000s. Alabama's there. Oklahoma's there. It's all the same schools. There is no competitive balance in college football. There's no competitive balance in women's basketball. There's a little more competitive balance in men's basketball for a couple reasons. One is that when you have a one and an out tournament, random events happen. And two is there's a depth, depth of male Andy, basketball I, talent I, I, I in may just country. not be following. Are you saying in response to Christine's point that the situation's like that already? I'm saying the situation is like that now because of amateurism and freeing up the market would improve things. Oh, that's a response. Well, it's not at all like that because, it's, I mean, the Yukon joke is funny except South Carolina won this year. South, say, South Carolina won't win. When was the last time Yukon wasn't in, in the final eight, let's say? Uh, I don't know. 16, but, 15 but not, years ago? But that's competition. What you are now going to do is add money. And you, I, I, I mean, it's, I've been covering sports since 1981. I am as sure as I'm sitting here, folks, that it will alter it and we will hate it. <laughs> who, who is a recruit, who sure is a recruit that, that someone got that South, that UConn, that Gino Ariama really wanted and he didn't get? Is, are, sorry, there, are there a lot of recruits out there that you can point to that Connecticut wanted? If and you then, were going to pay, then you're going to end up with, and, we, and I, we don't have to be, I think people know how we feel on this topic, but um, that, that you're just going to... Um, Say goodbye to competitive balance. Same with, same with, same with uh, sport. You know, Maryland beats Texas in football. That's not going to happen but under he, your system. I wanna, it's I not going to happen. I want to let Joe Nocera comment, but after that, I want to start going to audience questions. And the way it will work is if you raise your hand, I'll call on you. If you could stand up, wait for a microphone to come from you and tell me your name and then ask a very short terse question. Joe Nocera, I just want to respond. say quickly that... Um, you can take time. It's okay. uh, our esteemed opponents uh, mentioned several times the idea that we don't want college uh, sports to become the farm teams for the professional leagues. They already are. They already are. I mean, let's be honest. Why do they have this? Why, why do, does the NBA prevent athletes from, from being drafted until they're 19? Because they want to see them for a year in a college so that they can evaluate them. That's what farm teams are all about. I mean, the idea that this is something different from a farm team is silly. They are farm teams. I would agree with that point. However, how many, how many teams are in Division One? 351. And what? 351. And so every one of them is a minor league team. Because of the lack of the lack of true competitive balance, they're only looking at maybe 25 teams where these players, who some of them may have taken the underground money, have gone to those teams. Those are the guys they're looking at. The rest of college sports, when you go to Southern Illinois, do you think they're worried about, you know, are we going to go pro or something? They're worried about whether Southern Illinois wins the game. That's galvanizing community. When you go even Wichita State, which is a top 10 team now. You go there, and I've been there, they're worried about, you know, what is our team going to do? They're not thinking about these individuals. And the bottom line is, in all of that is, we talk about free market. 
uh, you know, competitive parity would be non-existence because of human behavior, because of self-interest and the need to win at any cost. That's what it comes down to. Connecticut is an anomaly. When you win year after year after year, everybody wants to be on the Yankees when the Yankees were winning. That's essentially what you have with UConn. And the Yankees were winning, of course, in the days when, when there was a cap on when right, there was a cap on salary. Right, well, and once baseball, how about from once baseball on. went to the okay, okay, market, okay, okay. I, I, I have to play referee for just a second. From '95 on, they stop. won. Get my stripes up here. Um, <laughs> I want to move on to audience questions now. Um, so I'll start right over there on the side. And by the way, I want to still explore the opening statement about exploitation of African-American players, and we haven't yet, so if anybody has got a question formulating in that area, uh, do this when you wave. I would like to call on you. So, go ahead, sir. Uh, if you could tell me your name, please, too. Hi, I'm Mike from uh, White Plains, New York. Sorry. Uh, my question is for the four. Um, I appreciate that you brought up the uh, points about the exploitation of athletes and coaches and universities taking advantage of them, and uh, I think that's really at the crux of this whole conversation of people not doing it. My question is, if we're trying to solve those problems, how is paying athletes in the long game going to help them if we're basically, the solutions you were talking about, about um, lifetime scholarships and things like that, seems to be a different conversation. It's still a university and we want education, we want to prepare these young people for the future. Is paying going to solve that problem? If, if you, if you are, are working a job 50 to 60 hours a week, uh, generating millions of dollars, uh, keep, keep it, allowing your coach not only to keep his job but to make his millions, to the assistant coach to make their millions, the, the conference commissioners to make their millions, for um, on and on and on. If you're doing all that and you're not being compensated at your fair market value, you are being exploited. That's the definition of exploitation. Now, this is not to say, this is not to say that there shouldn't, we shouldn't be figuring out ways to make it easier to do that job and to get an education. I mean, one of the big problems, putting aside pay, is the fact that, they're, that, that athletes are expected to take five to six classes a semester and work 50 to 60 hours a week uh, on their sports. It's almost impossible. And so I would say paying them is one of the ways of reducing the ways that the athletes are exploited. Can I ask Would, Yes, please, I well, want to respond. You know, Mike, when it comes to exploitation, let's not forget what they're getting in return. Now, the optics don't look good, but what I said at the end of my open was that for every complaint that they have, the, there are uh, options. There are, you can control spending, okay? You can make sure that the commercial dollars inure to the benefit of the health, safety, and welfare of the student athlete. And the way you do that, in my opinion, and I've been calling for this for years, is get an antitrust uh, exemption. Now, you know, we've heard Andy talk about, you know, cartels, they're illegal, blah, blah, blah. The Supreme Court has had great opportunities since 84 when they, they decided a case that gave football back to the conferences as opposed to NCAA authority. They've had ample opportunity to outlaw the whole thing. But there's one hitch education mission. And even in the O'Bannon case, the education mission prevented them from paying the student athletes the $5,000. Now, you know, I'm a believer in name, image, and likeness. That is a natural right. They should be compensated for that by, if by the that, schools by, use by, them. By that you mean the students should be compensated if their if faces they use, are on a right, poster if, or if a they use them to sell. If they use them to sell the but why, Well, that sounds free market-ish to me. Well, first of all, you're going to give there is To me, there is no such thing as a free market. It's always controlled by some All right, but, some, that, but, that's, some but that's some... There's, but there's, because it's a natural right. But why... And, go ahead. Because it's a natural right. You don't have any option. You either use it, use the natural right, and you get compensated, or you don't. They, they stopped utilizing that release that allowed them to use uh, the name, image, and likeness of the individual athlete with, without having to compensate them. So the NCAA recognized the error of their ways. But those things, right now, the NCAA is dying a death by a thousand litigation cuts. It's like the Wild West. You hear us go back and forth, back and forth about authority. In the Wild West, you know, they got what? Marshall Dillon, who had total authority to clean the place up. Now, if Congress allowed an antitrust exemption to the NCAA, gave them subpoena power, gave them the other powers to regulate, 
even coaches' salaries, regulate spending, regulate a whole host of problems to change those optics, I think we'd be okay. far better off. Let me, would you guys like to respond? Because I can move on to another question. I just can't. I, I, just, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't even know. It's impossible to respond to that because I, Jonas, I disagree right. so <laughs> profoundly yeah. with the idea that you should regulate right. everything. This would be like letting Enron re regulate financial reporting or something like that. Okay. I want to remind you that we are in the question and answer section of this That's intelligence. they don't have an answer to that. They'll no. It, here, here's the answer. Is that, is Wait, that, guys. Hang on a second. Let me say this for the sake of our podcast, and then I'll let you go back to that. We are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two, debating this motion, pay college athletes. And Schwartz, you want to continue your thought? Uh, well, so, so the idea of giving the NCA anti antitrust exemption, there, there, there was a scandal you may have heard about. There were some people from shoe companies paying some assistant coaches to encourage players to come to schools. And the NCAA's reaction was to appoint a committee. There's not a single current athlete on the committee. There's not a single person who believes in athletes' rights on the committee. It's every single person is employed by a university, is involved in the system. It is the classic example of if you let the, the fox run the hen house, you're not going to have a lot of hens left. And so it's not that I don't have a response. It's that it's the idea of shielding the NCAA from about the only force that's forced change, which is the antitrust law. Until for 40 years, from when you were in school, you were able to get $15. For 40 years, they banned the $15 a month because they said it was contrary to amateurism. Even though when you were there, it was fine. In 2015, finally, the O'Bannon case changed it. And they said, oh, well, no one's going to pay it. Every single school in FBS now pays three to $5,000 in cash to every what, athlete. That's not what caused the cost of attendance. That was name, image, and likeness. So let's, let's not mislead. I worked on the case. I can tell you that in the injunction, I, I, I know, there is a specific thing saying. But they were paying that before. The bottom line, though, is when you talk about nobody on that commission, and I don't have a great deal of faith, not because people, aren't, people are uh, related to the NCA. David Robinson, uh, Grant Hill, Condoleezza Rice, last I checked, they weren't related to the NCAA. But they're not radical thinkers. And that's what we need. And when I talk about an antitrust um, exemption, it's conditioned, conditioned on doing the things that I spoke of. If they don't do it, then let them die a death by a thousand litigation cuts. Okay, let me go but on. you got to give them a chance. Another question, um, right down here. Mike is coming down your left hand side. Hi, my name is Brian. Christine, earlier you mentioned 23 I guess so-called elite institutions, and then Len mentioned 351 D1s. Less than 1% is what we're talking. Yeah. My thinking is they probably generate maybe 5%, as much as 5% of revenues, as well as expenses. I know this is a sticky problem, but as a start, what about some type of revenue and expense tax at a certain clip level to fund some type of pool until we can figure out what, if anything, could be done to compensate these athletes, if at all? The, the pool could be interest-bearing over time, and it'd be not less urgency, but a, a better chance to assess the situation while building up some type of war chest that, if, if, if it's determined something equitable can be designed, there'd be funds to, to, to do that. So, Brian, what you're saying is that you would tax or whatever, the Ohio States, the Michigans, whatever, to give the money to the Michigan States and the Iowas, and what, you, you well, can see how about, that's going to go over. I, but I'm, we talked about I, parity, and you know, to take it that next step, yeah. they, they do suffer a, a wealth of, of, of benefit yeah. if they're spending the money and they're in, you know, okay. realizing I, the revenues. I, I, I need right. to cut you off to No, 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 and I, and I followed you're, up you're by asking clarification. you to clarify. Okay. Sure, Brian, okay. and you know, I, I think what we're seeing here clearly is there's a lot of, of, of fascinating conversation. I mean, we, we like these guys a lot, and uh, we get along great. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the key question is, is there value in a scholarship? You know what I'm saying? Because if not, then everything else, all the dominoes fall, right? So your point is a very good one if we are thinking, hey, let's have a pool of money and let's start paying athletes. That, that's as good an idea as any other idea. I, 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 can, is, I, was, I didn't mean to be flipped, but I can certainly see how Michigan, Ohio State, and Texas, and Florida are going to go, yeah, we're, you know, we're going to give our money so that you know, Auburn can beat us in women's soccer? Maybe not. You know, so I think that would be a, a, a fun regional problem right off the bat. But, but I, I still go back to this question, you guys. I mean, is there no value 
in a college scholarship. I, you know, I mentioned really? earlier, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, Forbes said two million plus, not only the scholarship, but the value, you know, the okay, coaching Christina, and all that. Let, let, you put it, that question right back out there yeah. again, director. Let's hear what your no opponents value? say about nobody, it. Nobody, nobody in the last hour plus has said that there's no value in a scholarship. Nobody said that. Well, no, but well, but what, what we've said, what we've said is, you know, number one, for many players, their fair market value will be more than what a scholarship entails. And secondly, we're saying that for too many players, the scholarship is devalued by what happens to them when they're on the campus. Now, Let, Lynn Elmore, do you want to jump, jump in? I'm just trying to figure out. You keep saying fair market value. There is no such thing as a free market. So who is determining what the fair value is? Yes. Somebody, somebody has to insert some regulation to determine what that is. No, there is no, no, no market no, no, no. without regulation. Len, they have these things called contracts. Yeah. You go, you, like you, the ones they sign right now. You negotiate. Now. You negotiate right. with a coach or with an athletic director and you come up with a sum of money. That's how you got your, that's what you do. That's what Christine done. Right. That's what everybody in this audience does. That's what people in America do. You don't need regulation but, but to negotiate But 17 year olds and 18 year olds need to They add have that agents. To their they need to have agents. Right. Oh boy. It's just no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. No. no. Okay. We, oh. so we see how the agents. Christine, Christine, we see well, what happens when wait, the agents are involved. Really I this, would like this a is a to huge. Talk, so. All right. Let me like give it to Andy. Schwartz. This is really important. Christine and Len don't want 18-year-olds to have to pay taxes. They don't want them to have to hire financial advisors. They don't want them to have agents. They want to infantilize them, and then they're worried when they get to the pros. Why are they so confused by all this money? And it's. It's, it's, well, Andy, let us this, say what we want, first okay. of all. Okay, all right, but, but what is wrong with having an agent? What is wrong with paying taxes if you earn good money? Okay, that's the end of a question. I'd like to put it to Christine. <laughs> and after Have that, by the way, look, Christine, I just want to point out on my next question, I'd love to hear a question from a woman in the audience and all the... And I just will answer with a question, which is, okay. uh, has everyone in the audience been 17 once? <laughs> I mean, again, yes. that you're going to college, you are getting a free ride, you are getting an education that is going to change your life. Is it perfect? No. Um, are there uh, fallacies? Is there, um, are people taking advantage? Sure. Is, is everything great in Washington, D.C. right now, folks, where I live? No. Th we, obviously, nothing is perfect. We're human beings. But uh, this system has worked very, very well for a long time. Again, we absolutely agree there are some issues out there, uh, but this cynical okay. uh, view of it is not the way to go. Okay, right there in the white t-shirt. If you could just tell us again your first name, please, thanks. Hi, um, my name's Ramona. Um, I'm wondering what both sides think about the idea of taking colleges out of the equation and allowing, like some of what was alluded to before, players to seek out compensation for pro like profiting off of their likeness through sponsorships outside of the college completely. I think it's a great, I think it's a great idea and I think it's long overdue and it's, it's the easiest, it's the easiest yeah, simplest thing that you could do to put, um, uh, to at least, to, to at least, if you're not going to go all the way to paying players, to at least have an Olympic-style so model where if a car dealer wants to get the University of Connecticut, Connecticut women's basketball team to do an advertisement, that should be perfectly legal, and they all should be able to get a little compensation from that. I, I don't see anything wrong with that at and all. And to clarify, it's now not legal. Well, it's not, yeah, well, I mean, not, not permitted. It's, it's not, not permitted, permitted by the NCAA. NCAA. Okay, let's take it to Lynn. Well, I, I, would, I would agree name, image, and likeness, as I said, is a natural right and you're entitled to be compensated for that. The biggest problem we have, though, is what's the process? And, you know, if you're looking at a football team and you want the quarterback to do, you know, this, this commercial, but the quarterback is only good because the left tackle is the one blocking for him. Okay, who should get the commercial? Who should get paid? I believe that if you do that, it should be a group licensing situation where all the money goes into a trust, and at the end of graduation, and I emphasize graduation, then they can access the trust. But yes, name, image, and likeness certainly should be compensated because it's a natural right. Another question? Right there. And the mic's coming to your right-hand side. Hello, my name is Crystal. Um, just to allude to what you said about how a lot of Be Decide against. 
uh, against, yes, okay. about how African Americans get a better opportunity because they're going to college and actually getting a quality education. Um, so what do you tell that student athlete that actually wanted to major in chemistry, but he couldn't because he, it, work, it doesn't work within his, um, his, his schedule for football, oh. or what do you tell what that nursing, question. or what do you tell that nursing student who wanted to go to the University of Tennessee, but her nursing classes won't work within her schedule, so she goes to another school, so she'll do that. So, just what are some, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thought, and that's a great question, and my thought on it is this: that student athletes prior to going in to university and being recruited have to elicit you know, some kind of promise and have to find the wherewithal to be advocates for their own education. You know, you can't sit there, and I tell, these, I tell kids this all the time when I speak, you can't sit there and allow people to track you. You have to follow your dreams and be an advocate. Once they're advocates for their education, then nothing's going to stop them. And there are people on campus that will help you become advocates for your education. If that's not the place, for you, then absolutely you have to do what that other person did, go someplace where you can be an advocate for, for your education. That's the key. And we talk about you know, 50 hours a week um, playing sports. If the NCAA had the enforcement capability, or if some authority had the enforcement capability, they would enforce the 20 hours a week instead of allowing it to, to go on and be, um, be taken advantage of as it is today. So, I mean, advocacy for your own education. You as a non-student, I guarantee you, you went and did what you wanted to do. Let's see if the other side wants to jump well, in on that well, point. Well, I mean, Jonas it's, it's, they're 17 years old, and you're basically saying they're, they're, they're too young to pay taxes, but they're not too young to advocate themselves in a very difficult situ situation with a coach who's trying to persuade them to come to their school. I that's mean, why, that's why you rely on you rely on somebody to help you be an advocate. But I just let's clear but something an up. Agent. I never said, <laughs> I never said, I never said that they're too too young to pay taxes. I just said it adds to the burdens. That's all. But, but so that up so let's Crystal, clear that up. Just uh, Crystal, your point. I, in be, being a journalist here, I, I think uh, I hopefully can say this. We hear about the things that don't go right often. Um, news, by definition, is when something isn't normal, right? A plane lands, it's fine. If a plane doesn't land, then that becomes news. Uh, God forbid that that happens. So we hear the horror stories in the news. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of college athletes who are able to play their sport and also get their degree in what they would like to get their degree in. And so one of thank them, you for your question. One of them went to Harvard Law School and became an assistant district attorney. <laughs> <laughs> right down in front, sir. Uh, the mic's coming on your right-hand side. Yes, hi, uh, my name's Pierre. Uh, to your point about a C student... Just so for people who are listening, just tell us who you're, which side you're addressing. Uh, I'm addressing the against side. Um, you stated that uh, a student athlete, to the extent that uh, he's not able or she is not able to major uh, or have enough time to devote to their major or the biology or what, what have you, he or she could transfer to another university. What about the rule whereby a coach can basically deny that transfer to that student athlete to go to another university? So if I'm at the University of Nebraska, and I want to major in biology. I don't have enough time to devote to it. I want to go to Wichita State. And my coach will not release me to go to Wichita State. I'm basically indentured to Nebraska, aren't I? Strong by by yeah. current rules. Pierre, how many, how many coaches do you think want that bad publicity? You can't go, you can't there, go to there another college. Where that, there have been instances where coaches will not release student athletes. But they won't release them for other reasons, not because of the academic reason, not that I've heard of. You may well, know something that I don't. But again, it's, it's somewhat disingenuous, right, when you say that, you know, we're looking out for African-American students, right. African-American student athletes. You have a case like University of North Carolina, right? One where case. Pierre, well, Pierre, just as moderator, Thank you for starting this discussion. I don't want you to debate with the debate. No, no, no. I, no, 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 no. But let, well, let's let let's well, let them well, let's let these guys take your okay. your, your well, side. Thanks. Okay. But thank you thanks. for putting it out there. Thank you. I like so I, I, I no, I know, but he's not on the stage. You are, so you have to take it. Thank you very much, up here. Andy or or Joe, do you want to follow up on that? Um, there's not much to say here. I mean, it just uh, 
he's right. It's a scandal. Uh, it happens too often. The transfer rule should be abolished, and that's about it. If, if, if you look at the, what the um, Northwestern athletes wanted when they were trying to unionize, people talked about it in terms of trying to get higher compensation. But what they actually wanted was some sort of contractual protections to allow the athletes to major in what they wanted to major in. I'm and sorry that thing keeps dro yeah. drooping on you. Why don't you? Uh, why don't I move on and you can? Sure. We'll shut. We'll shut that mic off so that you can fiddle fiddle it into a good position, and I'll go on to another question, right over here. And Hello, my name is Jill. I have a question for Len and Christine. Hi, Len. Hey, um, so it appears that many um, very talented uh, entering college athletes are not getting an education in high school and even perhaps in junior high school. So I wanted to find out how you feel that fits into the equation about not getting an education at the college level because uh, I, I'm, I'm basically repeating a statement I heard at another sports law conference recently that the problem with college sports is high school sports and the problem with high school sports is junior high school sports. In some ways, Jill, that, that's true. Um, but let's forget uh, for a moment that, you know, that it's just focused on um, you know, not getting an education in college because when you take a look the, the marker for socioeconomic um, uh, description in, in, in college is first generation. Either your mother or your father went to college. Today, only one in seven athletes, I think 19% in basketball, and maybe 20% in football, are first generation. And what does that mean? That means that from a socioeconomic standpoint, they're not disadvantaged. And why is that gentrification happening? The rising academic standards the cost of training to get to college, and finally, it, it really comes down to the middle class that can afford that. Now, in the end, it comes down to the fact that colleges with the APR, they don't want to recruit kids that can't get a certain GPA. And the ones who are in college, for the most part, and I'm not talking about football, maybe football is a little more difficult, but when they recruit kids, they want to get kids who can do the work so that their APR can, can remain above the level before they get penalized. So if they're not doing the work, then it's not because they're not capable of doing the work. And that's why I say, I think they're distracted. I think that many, often, many instances as a college basketball broadcaster, I talk to these kids. I look around, I, I wanna go see where they're going to class and what they're doing. And oftentimes, you know, they're not being held accountable. And that's the one thing we haven't heard, personal accountability. You know, I talk about being, own, own it, you know, be an advocate if you want it. All too often, guys are coming in thinking, I'm going to the pros. I'm going to make money. I'm Ben Simmons. I can go for one semester and go to class, and then after that, because I'm going to the pros, I don't have to go to school anymore. Okay, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question, sir, uh, here at the top, and it's coming down your left-hand side. Um, to the side against, uh, my question is, the proposal that you have put forward, the, the argument for the system that we have seems radically left-wing, that uh, we know that there are individuals, uh, a few percent, that generate tons of wealth for institutions, and so what best we can do is to take that money, uh, to use it for the betterment of the entire school, uh, and we do this in a paternalistic way, uh, and in exchange offer a scholarship. It seems to me that, that if we said the same should be done for the next Bill Gates or Zuckerberg that comes into an institution on a scholarship, develops at that institution some intellectual property that is incredibly wealthy, and that we say to them, we're going to tax that at 100%, and we're going to ask you to say thank you because you, we've given you a scholarship that, that we would protest. That's really it's, well phrased. It's not exactly a question, but I, <laughs> but I, think, I think they get it. You're, you're, it's really challenging the thing you said at the beginning, um, um, that uh, these players, the, the income that they're generating is for the good of the whole university. 
And the, the, the questioner called that radically left wing. Whether it is or not, that is your argument and he's challenging it. Why should that not apply to people who have, who, who have intellectual uh, gifts that produce results? Why should they not ultimately have to give back all of that to the university as he's saying that the players are being asked to do? Well, as I, I don't, and by the way, what is your name? I'm sorry. Yeah. Mushuma, thank you for your question. Well, as I understand it, if you were to say, um, this is not an area of expertise for me, but if, if a, a drug is developed in a university lab, well then that does come back to help the entire university. Um, yeah. I'm sorry? Not if it's a student. Yeah. Students own their IP. Okay. Um, this might be another topic for another day. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to I'm going to call it at no, that. Because it, but no, I but I do think there's some a little a little side note on this sure. that might be important is that um, this is discussed a lot of what does football mean to a school, and a lot of people I know this is anecdotal. It is not. I don't have this on a, a spreadsheet anywhere. They go for homecoming and then they go and they write a check for biology the next day. They feel really good about being around the football team. They saw their friends. Football is the place to go. So there, there's a lot there, and I appreciate your question. Can, um, go ahead, Len. Can I just answer real quickly? It's because, and we keep forgetting the phrase, education mission. You may not like it, but it's been a carve-out throughout these Supreme Court cases. Even Justice Wilkins in the... Um, in you know, O'Bannon case, said that these issues could be better addressed as a policy matter by reforms other than those available as a remedy for antitrust violation. Such reforms and remedies could be undertaken by the NCAA, member schools, conferences, or Congress. And that means essentially that the carve out for education mission makes it different than the commercial element that you're talking about, no matter how much commercialism occurs. And it all started with the 1984 case. I, I want to, I all of the questions have gone to the other side, so I want to give the foresight a chance to finish this if they would like to make a statement in response to everything that just happened. Jonas Sara, you can pass. I'm and okay. You can pass. There okay. Were, there were a couple students at Stanford, they invented a little thing called Google and they got rich. And, um, IP belongs to students, and, and, and so, should, so should the economic value of, of playing sports. And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is, pay college athletes. I, 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 think you, I think you missed a couple of really big pieces of this debate. Okay, we'll talk afterwards. Okay. Um, but, but thank you for your comment. Um, now we move on to round three, and round three are closing statements by each debater in turn, making his closing statement in support of the motion and returning to the intelligence square. Here is Andy Schwartz, sports economist and partner at OSKR. I can see that some of you in the audience recently graduated from college. Others, maybe you have kids or grandkids who graduated from college recently. Um, and you may be thinking to yourself, gosh, I wish my slow, short, kid had been exploited like those big burly <laughs> uh, athletes were. And the thing is, is that exploitation is not about some level. It's about the gap between what you get and what you're worth. And if your kid only got a half scholarship for merit, that's because that was the supply and demand factors that led to that. And the school gave your kid what your kid was worth, or gave you what you were worth. And the only people that that's not happening to right now are college athletes, and it's because of collusion. We live in a market economy. We might like the socialist economy, but, but we don't live in that. And it is an odd spot that suddenly we become very, very socialistic when we're talking about college sports. Um, and so um, I think it's important to think about exploitation here. The, the idea that an education is not valuable is not what I stand for. I have three degrees. I think education is extremely valuable. Exploitation is about getting less than you're worth. If an education is worth a zillion dollars, these athletes would get a zillion dollars and a hundred thousand more. It's, it's all about the gap. And so um, I'd like to leave you with this final thought about the word enough. Isn't it enough that they get a scholarship? Enough is a standard that we reserve for people who could receive charity, for children, and for chattel. When, when somebody owns a horse and gives the horse enough oats, 
combs it well. We say, what a good owner. And we, we, we think enough is good for the horse, but we, we let the, the horse's owner earn as much as she can running the horse in races. And so I want you to vote yes for the proposition, pay college athletes, because I think we should treat college athletes like the humans and not the horse in my analogy. And, and so I want you to think about what it means if, if the standard that you're using for yourself is I get what I earn, and the standard that you're using for collegians is it's enough what that means. Thank you, Andy Schwartz. The motion again is pay college athletes. And here making his closing statement against the motion, Len Elmore, attorney and former NBA player. Okay, enough. Um, no one ever said it's enough. In fact, we said more can be done. The current system needs to be changed. I talked about antitrust litigation uh, antitrust exemption to keep the current system but allow an authority to be able to make it fairer. At this point in time, one of the reasons it's the optics are bad is because there's no authority that can change it. You know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater by just paying people and going away, to me, that's almost degrading. You know, when you talk about, and the word indentured, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, we have the, the the cover of a book, we have um, people likening this to indentured servitude and slavery. You know, that to me is simply for shock value. Who can say that getting an education, a degree, and being able to move on, even if you play pro sports, who can say that that's slavery? And just because other people are making more money, that's going to happen in this real world. But the bottom line is, this is leadership development. This is still education. And no matter how many anecdotes we come up with that talk about the idea of, um, of poor classes, et cetera, there are hundreds that do it the other way. Josh Dobbs, quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers, 3.5 GPA in aerospace engineering. Myron Roll, a Rhodes Scholar, football player, played in the NFL, and then he went on to be a neurosurgeon. Len Elmore. Uh, an attorney, uh, a college basketball player, had the opportunity. If they were paying us, do you really think at 17, 18 years old, our focus would be on what, it ult what we ultimately became? Think about that. Thank you, Len Elmore. The motion again is pay college athletes. And here, making his closing statement in support of the motion, Joe Nocera, columnist for Bloomberg View. I... Um you walk into the college bookstore and you see your jersey and it's being sold for 50, 60, 70 bucks and you're not getting any of it. That's really leadership development, don't you think? That really teaches you a lot about how the world works. It does actually teach you a lot about how the world works. There's a deep cynicism among many athletes because they watch this system where everybody, with his money pouring, and they're getting none of it. I listened to our opponents talk tonight about all the things that would be so difficult about paying the athletes. Taxes, competitive balance, Title IX, contracts. These are all solvable problems. And not only are they solvable, they're actually pretty easy to solve. You just have to want to do it. And everybody in College Sports Inc., which is what I call it, is resistant to this idea because the current system works for them. So they don't really care how it works for the athlete. I want to finish on this, on this point. In the early stages of the fake class scandal at the University of North Carolina, a distinguished professor of history named Harry Winston wrote a letter to an alumnus who was upset that the scandal had become such a big deal. And here's part of what he wrote. We entice these players to entertain the public and enrich their coaches by performing a vast amount of arduous, dangerous, and unpaid work with the opportunity for a free education and a distant chance to go pro as their only compensation. Then we set up conditions which make the education either meaningless or nearly unattainable. To me, this situation is fundamentally immoral. 
If you want to start infusing some morality into this situation, not to mention some sanity, some acknowledgement of reality, and some justice, you need to start paying the players. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Sarah. That is the motion, pay college athletes. And here making her closing statement against the motion, Christine Brennan, sports columnist for USA Today. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, guys. Uh, what a delight it has been. It, it's been a lot of fun, hasn't it? Uh, I think we've all learned a lot. And uh, uh, we thank you so much for being here and for uh, tolerating our opinions. Um, you know, I think it really comes down to, you've heard it enough. I mean, I could just sit down right now. You guys have your ideas. But it's, it, it's, it's almost a cynicism about, well, the college scholarship isn't worth enough. Uh, we're not doing enough. Uh, this wonderful thing we've set up, which is college sports, which so many of you enjoy. Oh, that's not good enough. Um, I know it sounds probably like I'm saying the sky is falling, if it, it's going to be different. Folks, it's going to be different. And we may ruin it. Uh, to pay athletes when, in fact, they're already getting so much, in our humble opinion, with those scholarships. And I, it's easy for me to stand here and say that to you, but let me take you to two days ago when I was at my alma mater, Northwestern University, and I started a mentoring program for our female student-athletes, and now it's male and female student-athletes. And so I was talking with 20 or 30 students, speed networking, and uh, dinner, and what have you, and each and every one of them, some football players at Northwestern, uh, women's soccer, men's soccer, women's golf, swimming, uh, you name it. Every single one of them was so appreciative of the opportunity they were getting. This great education at a wonderful university, I'm very biased, um, and they, they get a chance to play a sport they love, and they get a chance, in this case, to meet so many professionals that can help them with jobs and internships and be launched into the lifetime of their dreams. They, when I asked them about this, they said, we don't need to be paid. We're here, and we're getting a college scholarship, and we're getting an education that is going to change our lives. Those are their words, not mine, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Christine Brennan. And that concludes round three of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. And now it's time to learn which side you feel has argued the best. I want to ask you again to go to the keypads at, I'm sorry, to go to your phones and uh, use that keypad to uh, vote yes, no, or undecided using the same process as before. Go to, the, uh, to a browser and enter in iq2us.org forward slash vote, and you will be presented with the choices. Okay, while that's happening, um, I want to say this about the, the times we live in. Um, we're living in a time when it's very difficult for people to have conversations in which they disagree and to maintain civility and respect for one another. The number of times that the four of you signaled respect for one another and conducted this with civility was notable and commendable. So I want to thank you all for the way that you did this and the, the way that you brought this. Um, I also want to let you talk a little bit about what's coming up for our programs. We're going to be back here at the Kaufman Music Center on November 14th. We're going to be debating the stock market is too high. On Thursday, December 7th, we're going to have a former presidential candidate and Vermont governor, Howard Dean, coming back to return to us. This time the debate is going to be on the motion, liberals hold the moral high ground. And Howard Dean will be arguing for the motion. Uh, on the other side, ar arguing against it, we'll have the leading conservative philosopher, Robert George, and the New York Times op-ed columnist, David Brooks. Tickets for that are available through our website. And as I mentioned at the beginning, for folks who can't join our live audience, there are a lot of other ways to catch the debates. You can visit our website. It's up there at iq2us.org. You can vote on the debates whether you attend or not. You can watch and listen to podcasts. Membership is free there, so set up an account. Um, and you can watch all of our debates, as I mentioned earlier, also on Roku and Apple TV. Uh, you search uh, on Apple TV or Roku for those uh, apps, and you can also download uh, our app from the Apple Store and from Google Play, and uh, stay in touch with us via Twitter and Facebook. Um, I've, uh, folks who are our regulars know that I always say this, Intelligence Squared US is a philanthropy. We put on these debates and we set them out into the wilderness um, for free, basically, and uh, they, they educate, they elucidate. We think they're raising the level of public discourse, which is so much 
uh, an important part of our mission. They're being used in universities. And we have a number of people who are, who are supporting us through this, but we're always trying to grow that number. And small donations are as appreciated as large ones. Uh, for that, to help us out in that way and make a contribution, you can visit our website, again, iq2us.org, or you can use your phone to text the word debate to the number 797979, and you'll get a link to donate online. So any amount on that helps. The other thing I wanted to say about tonight, um, there's a lot of times in the course of the debates uh, where uh, audience questions get a little bit problematic, and I have to make some hard choices to turn people down. I actually think that the questions tonight were uh, were really excellent and superb, and I didn't have to kick anybody out. So thank you, because it takes a lot of courage and guts to get up and ask these questions. And I know that there are a number of you that I didn't get to, so I appreciate that. But maybe you can, you can uh, buttonhole the uh, debaters a little bit uh, right afterwards uh, if you approach the stage, but better, and more if, uh, even better if you go out to the reception afterwards. So um, give us about another 30 seconds, and I'm going to be getting the results uh, high-tech via my iPad. A screen will pop up and, and tell me that. I'm just curious. Um, among our debaters on the team tonight, since you argued so civilly, did anybody hear anything from their opposing side that actually they thought, well, I've got to think about that. I haven't seen it that way before. Anybody break through to you one way or the other? Well, well I, I will say, I, I will say, it, Joe and I have done this before on uh, the Stephanopoulos show with Martha Raddatz. Uh, and uh, and I, I actually, both of your points, I, I listen, I want to learn. Um, and as, we, as I think we've all said throughout, there's a lot of uh, uh, things to discuss and make better. And so, uh, Len yeah. Len and I also uh, debated in yeah. Houston at the Final Four a couple of years ago, so we both knew each other's moves. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> all right. We were scouted. But I will say this, Christine's been our good cop, so we <laughs> want to make sure that everything's over. No, there were a couple of points that were very well yeah. made. I mean, but the point that I agree with is name, image, and likeness. There should be compensation yeah. because it's a natural right. All right. Well, guess what? I have the results in now. Here is how it played out. The motion, pay college athletes. Again, it's the difference between the first and the second vote that determines our winner. In the first vote on pay college athletes, 42% of you agreed with the motion. 33% were against the motion. 25% were undecided. In the second vote, the team arguing for the motion, their first vote was 42%. Their second vote, 60%. They pulled up 18 percentage points. That is now the number to beat. The team against the motion, their first vote was 33%. Their second vote, 32%. They lost a percentage point. That means the debate goes to the team arguing for the motion, pay college athletes. Our congratulations to them. Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody, very much.